black bright so good morning good afternoon good night depending on, on which part of the world you are watching me from um just want to ask you to subscribe if you can like or put the down thumbs down if you don't like it and you can interact with my subscribers today i wanted to you know after the video that's going around about the vaccinations and that is going to be mandatory and a lot of people feel uneasy about that I wanted to ask the question, what is it about vaccinations that makes us so nervous? What are we really afraid of? I mean, death is inevitable, so we can't really be afraid of that, although none of us want to die prematurely. But putting death aside, what is it about vaccinations that make us concerned and I was thinking to myself, us born in the UK, and I think in different parts of the world, we grew up with vaccinations. I mean, we all went for the six in one. We all had our rubella, our diphtheria and all stuff like that. And we never thought, we never gave it a second thought. And we vaccinated our children without giving it a second thought until after a certain period, parents started saying, you know, they didn't want to get their children vaccinated for whatever reason it could have been religious reasons it could have been personal beliefs it could have been anything but and then what happened is because of that especially with regard to measles um the uk was no longer at the top with regard to being a measles free country and they lost their credibility with regard to giving out vaccines so i'm wondering now whether or not it's because um, the UK want to get their status back as being a virus-free nation by the WHO. But that doesn't stop our fears, does it? How can the government restore our confidence in the vaccine? Because what's happened now is that people are so scared of the vaccine because of whether it's rumours, whether it's our history, whatever it is. We've got the Tus Tuskegee experiment that you can't get out of your mind if you're black. You've got, you know, people dying of polio, all those people who died from HIV and they claim it was associated with the vaccine. And so you've got lots of, um, there's a history, there's baggage with the vaccine. And that is the problem. It comes with baggage. And I don't know how you're going to get rid of that baggage. So what did I write down in my little notes? Before vaccines, it is alleged millions of children died from infectious diseases such as whooping cough, polio and measles. And vaccines for children became mandatory in the United States in 1963. But in the UK, it's still not mandatory. They're working towards making it mandatory. However, the UK Vaccination Acts of 1840, 1853, 1867 and 1898 were a series of legislative acts passed by the Parliament of the United Kingdom regarding the vaccination policy of the country. So the question is, or the question that has been raised, is why do we need another Coronavirus Act for 2020? Why is this vaccination so different than, it, than previous vaccination? Why is it being treated differently? And why, and I think the concern is, is that the UK, their, their response to the coronavirus is totally different than the rest of the world. And I think that's what's also causing concern. The fact that we have an emergency power for two years, when all the other countries are getting on their feet, like within three to six months. So all of those things are raising concerns. And I think the government needs to allay the public fear. I also think that the reason for the over dramatic response or reaction um, as legislated, you know, locking people up, um, detaining them, um, um, if they don't, if they don't take it, they get fined and if you get fined every day for it and all of that. I think that's just in anticipation of a negative reaction. 
because I think ultimately they want to vaccinate as many people as they want and they perceive resistance. Now, the thing is, is that with vaccinations, they have been going on all the time. It's just that we haven't really been taking them on. I mean, people have been having flu vaccines all every year, every year, every year, and it hasn't received the same response as the corona vaccine. I think it's there's mitigating factors and the fact that it, it's linked with the lockdown. It's linked with quarantine. It's linked with all these coronavirus deaths. It's linked with them not being open about how many recoveries there are. And I think all of the, you know, these bits of omissions and these little bits that sneak out every five minutes are what are creating fear and suspicion and confusion. If the government was up front and if it was transparent and everything was um, done in a, a believable way, people wouldn't be responding in the way that they are. So as far back as 1853, the vaccination law of that period required universal vaccinations against smallpox in England and Wales, with fines levied on people who did not comply. However, the current child vaccinations are not mandatory. But the fact of the matter is, levying fines if you don't have the vaccine has been going on since 1853. I don't think people know that. The penalty for non-compliance with the coronavirus seems much more extreme, which is why people are wary. And like I said, I think that's because they're anticipating um, resistance. And we can understand why. England has been stripped of its measles-free status by the World Health Organization because parents, for religious reasons and otherwise, were not consenting to their children being vaccinated. And because it was to do with autism, they claimed that um, a lot of children who were vaccinated became autistic. We don't know whether or not there is a link, but that is why people were concerned. So um, parents in England are currently allowed to refuse to let their children get vaccinated by the health secretary. But he's looking to change that. The health secretary is looking to change that, Matt Hancock. So herd immunity, the level of immunisation at which a population is considered to be protected from disease is about 95%. So 95% of people would have to be immune to um, the virus in order for it not to be a threat. People are concerned about unnatural chemicals being injected into the body, especially untested. And the thing is with the coronavirus, it's, it's alleged that it hasn't been tested on animals. It's just going straight from the lab to the human. And also, they've got this thing called plug and play, which is why it's, they're managing to bring it out so quickly. But they reckon that's been tested. I don't know. I think it's been tested on humans. And it's supposed to be 100% effective. I, I, I cannot um, guarantee that. You know, this is what they reckon on this plug and play vaccination, which the coronavirus um, vaccine is supposed to be associated with. So the current recommended vaccine that has been going on for yolks, six in one, that's a diphtheria, hepatitis, um, hip type B, polio, tetanus, whooping cough. And then you have the pneumocor vaccine, a guard against pneumonia, septicemia and meningitis. And then you have the men B vaccine. It seems to double up on the pneumonical um, vaccine, which and that is protecting against meningitis or meningocal infection, which which can lead to meningitis and sepsis in young children, which can lead to meningitis and sepsis in children. So I don't know if the pneumonical the pneumocal whatever, however you pronounce it, vaccine is for adults and the men B is for children. I'm not quite sure. And then you have the rotavirus vaccine, which guards against rotavirus, which is a stomach bug in babies. So 
if you're born in the UK, you're quite used to having vaccines. That's, that is the first thing. So what makes this one so different? Like I said, it's the rumours attributed to it that makes it different. History, like I said, the Tuskegee experiment, deaths with HIV, um, claims of infertility. And what makes it even worse is that video that came out, that TEDx video with Bill Gates talking about vaccinations to use depopulation. And Kissinger also said that in his paper. So you've got people paranoid that the vaccination is some kind of depopulation strategy. And then, of course, you've got the claims that it causes meningitis and autism. The thing is that with regard to the Tuskegee experiment and the HIV, um, all those people that died in Africa, and um, it's mostly with black, it's mostly affected black people. So that's why I think black people are a bit more sceptical than white people because white people don't seem to be bothered by it. So, so that is why I'm trying to under, why I'm trying to equate why um, not just not, it's not even just black people are afraid. I think white people are wary as well, but for different reasons. Um, I think they're more concerned about you know what is going on with. The lockdown and whether or not it's legal and you know but this is just an added stress so to speak so you've got the confusion as to whether you know young children are still having vaccinations against diphtheria and whether or not it's still a threat is it still a threat we don't know we've got um, suspicion as to why we need something to violate our body and some people you know especially religious people feel as though this is God's vessel and it shouldn't be contaminated with artificial um, any t anything artificial um, they're wary of motives who's behind it um, some people are talking about will the RFID you know the the um, what do you call it you know, the chip, if that's going to be infected and injected in the same time, well, it can't really because the needle is a totally different needle and it's going into a totally different place. So some people are looking at, are not looking at scientific journals or they're sceptical about scientific journals. God-fearing people are not compatible with science. That's one thing we know. But it is it would, might be useful for those of people who are concerned to look at some of the scientific journals just to get a feel of whether or not this paranoia about the vaccine is justified or this fear about the vaccine is justified, regardless of whether it's justified, justified or not. Nobody wants to feel as though they're, as, especially as adult, that they're being forced to, um, to take it. I mean, with the flu... That was, I mean, that wasn't forced, but it was almost because it was just repetitive, repetitive. Have you had it? Emails here, emails there. If you haven't had it, why you haven't had it? And you've got to put all this list about why you're not having it. So even with the flu virus, that wasn't mandatory, but it was, it felt mandatory, if you see what I mean, as opposed to the coronavirus, with the flu virus has killed much more people than the coronavirus, but the coronavirus is being treated differently. And I think that is what's causing the fear and suspicion. Anyway, I cannot say whether vaccinations are good or bad, but I can suggest that you read up on it because black people seem to be more fearful about the vaccines than white people. And that's just an observation. You know, you talk about white people about the vaccines, and there's, ah, you know, they don't see nothing wrong with it. And I'm not even saying all black people um, ha have an issue with it. But you'll find that those people who have an issue with it are those who are, as they say, are woke. Those people who know about their history. And the thing is, sometimes when you know about your history and what's gone on before, you link it to the present and it may not have anything to do with the present. I'm not saying it has or it hasn't. Because we really do not know what's in the minds of these people. We really don't know. We do not know whether this is a depopulation exercise. We don't know. But the fact that the government isn't coming out and being open with us 
is what's causing the apprehension and the fear and to make it worse. So, and the thing is, how the hell, you know, sometimes I think we're being set up to be fearful, to be afraid. I've said that before. Sometimes I think we're being set up to be afraid in order to raise the stress levels, in order to be susceptible to the virus. Sometimes I think that because how the hell did someone find out about that new legislation on the 27th of April? Well, I guess if you're an immigration lawyer, maybe. That guy that um that guy that did the video that I, I showed you yesterday about the mandatory vaccination. I actually decided to vote. And when I went to vote, it was like a um a program. I thought it was something like change.org. You just click and you just vote. But this one wanted all your details, which was quite off-putting, even though I went through it. But they wanted all your details. And then at the end of it, they're asking you to become a constituent or they're asking you whether or not you want to be um, um, those, you know, those councillors or whatever. And I thought, you know, it wasn't it. It was it's almost like that was a guise for something else, which I don't think is going to be received very well, because when somebody else wants to do something similar that has more credibility they're going to be doubtful so yes you might have the right information but I don't think it's fair to do it under the guise to to kind of get you onto their kind of database and you know what you know next thing you know you're going to be asked to vote for this and vote for that and all that kind of stuff so I think there was about 883 people who signed because that process is off-putting and the thing is, is that whether you are um, legit or not legit, when I say legit or not legit, whether you are, you have all your um, paperwork, whether it's been finalised, you're losing a lot of the market by asking for all those questions. And yet a lot of people will be concerned. So it's not representative of the type of the people who would be concerned about mandatory vaccinations when you have to go through such an arduous process. And, it's, you know, the voting is about your opinion on why it shouldn't go through. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But I think that having to fill up all that information is going to turn a lot of people off. I mean, to be honest, I, I got to the point where um, I completed it and then they you kind of signed the link to get onto the website. Once you, once you filled it up, then, you know, you activate the link so they know that it's you and that you're genuine. And then they're asking you, um, I think, for your address and your telephone number. And you're like, that's a bit too much information. So then I went back and to make double sure that it was authentic and that, you know, it's all above board before I gave that information. But the fact of the matter is people are not going to want to do that. And it's not allowing you to vote unless you complete all of that. So I think that's very unfortunate that that opportunity has been missed to get that act passed just because of bureaucracy. Anyway, that's just me going off on a tandem as usual. Okay, in Germany, uh, penal, um, Germany they penalise parents with fines if, they, if their children are not vaccinated. In Australia, if you don't um, have your children vaccinated, you can't get no um, the equivalent of universal credit, no benefits, nothing. You have to be vaccinated. So it's not all I'm saying is it's not just the UK. Mind you, sorry, I'm getting confused. These are children's vaccinations that they're making that are mandatory. They're not. It's not the coronavirus, which is different. So in California, Vermont and Washington, they have tightened requirements for using the personal belief exemption. So that means, you know, whereas you could have um, been exempt because of your personal beliefs or your religion, you, it's tightened. It's much more difficult to prove. But this isn't about vaccinations. I don't even think this is about vaccination. I think this is about our lack of trust in the government. That's what I think. Because even when um, those people took photographs of the army troops 
going up and down the M1 or going down the M1 from goodness knows where to London. You know, all, you know, so much of it is done undercover. So much we have to find out ourselves. Why can't they, even if that legislation went through, why isn't it making headline news that vaccinations are going to be, were made mandatory on the 27th of April? Why isn't it headline news? At least if it was out in the open, people could trust the process. But because everything is snuck in and undercover, that's why, that's why people have got an issue with it. What else have I got here? So, we feel like scapegoats. Because, like I said, you know, I think um, one country, I think it's Australia, they've tested it on a couple of ferrets. And then this month, at the end of this month, probably around now, they're testing it on humans. But it's the Aborigine. It's the Aborigines in Australia, not the white people in Australia, from what I understand. So they're, all, they're, they're starting it from this month. And then um, I forget the other country where they haven't tested it. I think it's America where they haven't tested it on animals yet. They're going straight from the lab to the humans. So, yes, many of us would prefer to leave our holy vessel intact but for many it's already contaminated you can only oh well i only said that already science are trying to teach our immune systems about viruses and bacteria and how to attack it the problem is if the bacteria or vaccine is engineered or manufactured the body's immune system is not facing a realistic or natural scenario and that is where things go wrong. The body's natural immune system may reject the artificial inter interference and cause irreversible reactions or damage to the human body. Scientists don't know the outcome, or, and nor do we. Scientists are willing to risk lives to learn more about how the human body reacts to their interventions. And this is their primary goal. And that is what's scary. The fact that scientists, they know that they're on the right track, but the only way they can test that it works is on humans. So humans are being sacrificed for science. Basically. Right? They're always saying we're being guided by science. In sensing this is the motive for vaccines, it is no wonder people are afraid. You know, we prefer to leave well alone. Don't fix what ain't broke. More viruses are coming. Like even if they get a vaccination for this one, there's going to be more coming next year. Apparently, this is the 18th one, 18th coronavirus. And yet they weren't so insistent. They didn't react to the others um, the way they're reacting to this one. What is it about this particular virus that is so special, that demands lockdown, that demands such different treatment? And you see, these are the things that the public want to know. If, if the government was open as to, and if they were even to say to us, look, we've got 80, this is the 80th coronavirus and we don't want any, we don't want to see any, well, they can't say they don't want to see any more. But if this is the 18th coronavirus and we've survived it and we didn't even know the coronavirus, there were so many coronaviruses before, why, why are we being so shielded from this one? What is it about this one that is so different, that demands a different handling, that demands military intervention, that demands 25,000 more police or how many more police they're having, that demands lockdown, that demands quarantine, that demands the economy, suffer as a result. What is it about this particular coronavirus nine COVID-19 that is so different from the previous ones and so different from the flu and so different from the SARS? When the SARS was killing all those bloody millions, did they close the country down, the world down? No, they didn't. Anyway, um, additional studies are always needed to confirm benefits and effectiveness. 
as it is the feeling that we are human, and, and it is this feeling that makes us feel like human guinea, pig, guinea pigs, that makes us feel fearful. Um, what else? How can public confidence be restored? The Royal Society of Public Health Chief Executive Shirley Kramer said the compulsory vaccinations should be the last resort, but then she was talking about children's vaccinations. So, um, but that is going to, that's working its way through. Kramer felt UK-wide compulsory policy might be hard to justify, but with the coronavirus, it has been justified. If you're thinking about the children and they found it difficult to justify it doing it for the children with the adults, they're justifying it through the coronavirus and talking about it's um, a, an infectious disease. They're making it out like it's something, you know, almost like a leper. That's what it, that's what it's that's what is being made out to be something so dangerous and so contagious and you know I don't get it. I wish I did get it. So bye bye religious objections, bye bye family life and human rights. Whether COVID nineteen is an excuse to introduce mandatory vaccines or not. The public concern is only that they are safely administered and there are no devastating side effects. Because really and truly, that's all we want to know. That's the only reassurance people want. If the government came out and said, look, you know, these vaccines are safe. We can assure you they're safe. But the problem is they can't because they haven't tested them. And they're saying they cannot guarantee that they're going to be effective. They cannot guarantee the side effects because they haven't been tested on humans. But having said that, they do have 800 volunteers who will be testing them. And so within a certain period, that we should know whether or not they're OK. I mean, I don't think they intend to vaccinate us anytime soon. Because the trials with these 800, I think they're probably, they'll probably get reactions, if there are any, within maybe a couple of months, maybe about three months, maybe. And I think they're hoping to start the vaccinations in October. So by October, they would have got the reaction from these 800 people who have volunteered to um, take the vaccine, you know, to try human trials. So at least by then, we should have heard something, not unless it's all hush-hush, but hopefully it's going to be open and a transparent process because that is all people want. They want an open and transparent process. They don't want deception. They don't want lying by omission. They just want the truth. And, and I, we did not, you know, it's our right. If you want to inject us with something, that's fine, but tell us. Tell us that we're going to be okay. Reassure us. You can at least say, you know, rather than do those mandatory, making it mandatory to have a vaccination, what they should be saying is that, okay, we're testing, we're doing human trials on 800 people who have volunteered. And once those trials have been completed, we'll then have a pick, we'll then have an idea about whether or not we can go ahead with the mandatory vaccination, because we know now, as a result of those 800 who have taken the vaccination, that it's safe to use. Then people can say, oh, thank goodness. You might not want to be one of those that go for a trial, but there are people who have. And so they have been our guinea pigs. And therefore, we can feel a bit more relaxed about it and think, OK, it's fine. At least they've had it. So and they're OK and they've survived. Pity we can't see who they are so we can actually ask them. You know what I mean? Because every bit of any way that you can reassure the public and raise their confidence is the best thing, because that's what minimises resistance, restoring confidence. So what else have I got here? So once 
Okay, once it's um, cleared by the 800 and it goes through, and then um, it goes through medical approval, uh, the, me the medical regulators will approve it, and that, at that point, they, they'll be allowed to use it. So as long as the medical re regulators aren't in cahoots with anybody else, it should be okay. Fingers crossed. So the coronavirus trial has skipped the animal test research phase to test its safety and effectiveness. Oh, that was in Seattle. In UK, 800 will receive the COVID-19 vaccine. There's no information on whether or not it has been pre-tested. Um, Sanofi and GSK teamed up to produce the vaccine. Australian scientists have begun ejecting ferrets um, and will test on humans the end of the, this month, which is April. And I think they were testing um, on ferrets last month, March. Yeah. Um, but none, no one knows how effective they're going to be until hopefully um, it's been in these bodies, these volunteers' bodies, for a few months. Problem is, they say, the fewer that are infected, the longer it takes to work. There is such a thing as a challenge study. This is what we've heard of, where they actually inject you with the virus. So this is where they give people the vaccine and then deliberately infect them with the virus. And that is to see whether or not the vaccine works. It's a bit back to front, but it can be dangerous. Um, and I'm just hoping that that's not what they're thinking of doing. So the goal is to make 60 to 70 percent people immune to stop it spreading easily. But if we're all locked up or locked down, how can that happen? What really should be happening is that we should be all out on the loose. That's what would make sense if they really want us to see if we can build up a herd immunity or see whether or not we are OK and whether or not people catch it or not. Put everybody back out. People die of the coronavirus. They're telling us about people dying every five minutes anyway. What difference does it make? Let everybody go back to work. Get stuck in. If you catch it, you catch it. If you don't, you don't. And then you can do your vaccines based on a realistic experience. But you can't protect people from getting it, saying you don't want people to get it and protect them from it. And then later on, you need people to have it in order to test, use the vaccine. It's no point using the vaccine on people who haven't had it because then you don't even know if it works. Oh, and I'm not even a health professional. Um... So it seems to defeat the purpose of locking people up. I've said that. The work on a new coronavirus is using an approach called plug and play, which I mentioned before. Plug and play responds rapidly to biological threats. They are meant to be safe and confer full protection after a single dose and are much quicker to produce. So um, what else have I got here? Yeah, I was talking about the lockdown a while ago. I mentioned um, Francis Hall before, barrister of Field Court Chambers. The lockdown measures imposed by the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions England regulations are some of the most extreme restrictions on fundamental freedoms imposed in the modern era. They are disproportionate interference with the rights and freedoms protected by the European Convention of Human Rights and therefore unlawful. And not only that, the lockdown lowers your immune system. So the regulations impact family and private life, which is Article 8, religious practice, which is Article 9, association and assembly, which is Article 11, property, which is Article 1 of the protocol, education, which is Article 2 of the protocol, and liberty, which is Article 5. They represent an unprecedented intrusion into the freedoms and livelihoods of the public at large. Apparently, there already existed legislation designed to tackle the circumstances of coronavirus, which has been classified as an emergency by the government and their scientific advisers. Yet rather than use this framework, they've resorted to fresh legislation in the Coronavirus Act 2020.
And that is what people are asking. Why? Why is this being treated so differently? Why the overkill? And that's all for now. Bye-bye.